Hey everybody, episode 32. Middle East, oil, oil, oil. Oil, Middle East ranks among the most geopolitically important places in the world because of oil. Geopolitically, geopolitics, what drives the world? Oil, Middle East has the most oil. Okay, the US, the U.S. saw allies in the Middle East and caused regime change to secure access to oil supplies and prevent the spread of communism there. Containment, uh, Truman Doctrine. Regime change is a very important concept. Uh, it's not something that I'm real happy about. Regime change that means that we go into other countries and help to overthrow their democratically elected rulers or the rulers that are the rulers of those countries, but we are not those countries, but we go change their rulers. And Iran is the most significant place that we've helped with regime change. In 1948, Truman recognized Israel the day it was created. They are still our closest ally in the Middle East. Uh, just on that note, 1947, India became an independent nation for the first time in history, even though they've been around for almost 10,000 years. Uh, one of the earliest civilizations. Um, but Israel, Israel, and you know about the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, that are pal those are Palestinians, and there's a whole course involved in that. I had faith in Israel before it was established. I have it in it now. I believe it has a glorious future before it, not just another sovereign nation, but as an embodiment of the great ideal of our civilization. They are our BFF. We give them more money than any other country on earth because they are a democracy in the middle of what used to be the Ottoman Empire. If you remember, the Ottoman Empire was created by uh, the sykes pico Agreement, I think in 1915, during World War II. <clears throat> Arabs were furious about the creation of Israel. That's a Jewish uh, country right smack dab in the middle of what had been uh, entirely an Arab place before that. In, 1895, only 5% of the Middle East was Jewish. And then now there's an entire Arab uh, Israel Jewish country there. Uh, the Middle East is controlled. Um, Arabs were furious about the creation of Israel. And they, the Arabs, controlled the oil supplies of the region. In 1953, the CIA engineered a coup d'etat. A coup d'etat. To, uh, in Iran to protect the oil supplies in the region. A coup d'etat is an overthrow of the government generally by the military, but we helped to orchestrate that. It's a very sad, very sad. How does the CIA overthrow a government? The CIA and British hired the leaders of a bunch of street gangs in Tehran and used them to help create the impression that the rule of law had totally disintegrated in Iran. Iran. They hired a second mob to attack the first mob to give the impression that there was no police presence and order had completely disintegrated. In the middle of the Cold War, the United States played a role in the overthrow of a democratically elected Iranian government. Barack Hussein Obama admitted that that took place in 1953 and that we were a part of it. Uh, this is Mo uh, Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. The US helped install Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi as the new ruler of Iran so that the oil was protected for the first time, but it led to the increased wrath of the Arab world to the US. That is in 1953, and that wrath still exists today, as you are well aware. Um, so the thing is, is that whenever you talk about having a, uh, sorry, somebody's knocking on the door, it's confusing me, that when you have a, a thank Renee, I'm not answering that door. I'm going to laugh if it's one of you guys that are knocking on my door. Um, anyway, so we put a new ruler in Iran, and in 1979, it's going to go back to the Ayatollah Khomeini and, and very, very strong Arabs, um, Islam, a Muslim nation. President Gamal Nasser, Abdul Gamal Nasser of Egypt, needed money to build a dam on the Nile River. He courted the, USS, the U.S. and USSR to help fund it, and we did not. So he turned to the Soviets. We did not help him, and so Egypt received aid from the Soviet Union and nationalized the Suez Canal. 
the Suez Canal is to go from the Mediterranean Sea through the Red Sea and to the Indian Ocean. Then in 1956, the Suez Crisis occurred when France, Britain, and Israel invaded Egypt expecting the U.S. to supply needed oil, but Ike refused and they withdrew their troops. In 1960, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, Iran, and Venezuela formed the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. You have to know that it's called OPEC. OPEC means that they produce and export oil all over the world, and then they artificially set high prices, and that made us mad and created much uh, disruption between us and the Middle East. So Ike has a second term, even though he'd had a heart attack and a few health scares, uh, he easily won. Again, as you can see, the Deep South is still uh, blue. Blue, that's Democrats. It's going to change with Nixon. The Democrats question Ike's health. He had a heart attack in 55 and abdominal surgery in 56. Uh, John Foster Dulles died of cancer in 1959, and presidential assistant Sherman Adams resigned amid scandal. Kind of left him on his own. Those were his major advisors. Ike was now without his two most trusted advisors, thus he became more personally engaged in his second term. Um, the Eisenhower Doctrine means that anybody in the Middle East that wants our support or military help from us, as long as they are fighting communism or the belief that they are being attacked by communism, then Eisenhower says that we are going to help. The Eisenhower Doctrine. In 1959, a rash of labor strikes here, domestic affairs, and reports of corruption among union leaders led to reform. Lots of labor strikes. This is famous. This guy's famous. This is Jimmy Hoffa. Teamster chief Dave Beck was imprisoned for embezzlement, stealing money, and replaced by Jimmy Hoffa, who disappeared. The Teamsters were booted out of the AFL-CIO. Um, most people believe he was fitted with a nice pair of cement boots. That means they threw him in the river and killed him. Nobody's ever found him. We still have never found any idea where Jimmy Hoffa, what happened to him after that. But he, he's apparently dead. He was probably dead then. In 1959, the Landrum Griffin Act finally brought labor leaders under control. So there's a little bit of a control of labor by this point in 1959. Uh, Alaska and Hawaii became the 49th and 50th states. In 1951, the 22nd Amendment limited Ike and any other future president to just two terms. 22nd, two, 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 two terms. And Ike's greatest weakness was his ignorance of social problems, though he was not a racist, but he did not focus much on civil rights issues, even though civil rights issues were happening all around him. But he was golfing. Ike had his critics, but he ended one war, the Korean War, and kept us out of another, Vietnam. You have to know that he has mostly domestic policies and domestic affairs because he took us out of those wars. That lovely title, ex-president. And then as he was leaving, one of the most famous speeches in history, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. <coughs> people that make and manufacture and sell weapons. <coughs> Ike famously used his farewell address to warn of the military-industrial complex, the powerful link between government and war, war industries, people that make supplies for war. The race with the Soviets to space, called space race. You have to know, the Cold War space race. And this is what we saw, the kitchen debate, 1959. Oh, I thought it was kitchen table. Kitchen debate where it was we were, Nixon, the vice president, was bragging, bragging, bragging about all of these great things that we have and toasters and refrigerators and TVs and everything else. And Khrushchev basically laughed at him. and was like, dude, we have missiles. Like, we don't care about your TVs. It was pretty funny. Lawnmowers, supermarkets, stock full of groceries, Cadillac convertibles, makeup colors, lipstick, spiked heels, shoes, hi-fi sets, cake mixes, TV dinner, and Pepsi-Cola. All that, but we don't have any missiles. 
Many things you've shown us are interesting, but they are not needed in life. They are merely gadgets. He's right. Sputnik. I didn't make this PowerPoint. I don't know why the guy has a question mark there. What does that mean, question mark? Hey, buddy who made this, what's that mean? I don't know what that means. That's Sputnik. <coughs> 18,000 miles per hour. On October 4th, 1957, Russians launched Sputnik, the first man-made object in space. And now we just have all sorts of space trash out there. It's a lot. Americans were demoralized. Was this, was this satellite proof that communism was superior? Sputnik. But we have TVs. Critics suggested Americans misuse science by creating things like TV instead of missile technologies. Our movies and television programs in the 50s were full of the idea of going into space. What came as a surprise was that it was this USSR that launched the first satellite. It is hard to recall the atmosphere of the time. Four months after Sputnik, the U.S. set up its own satellite, the Explorer. Isn't that funny? Look at them. That's what they were dressed like. Fears of a science gap with the Soviet Union led to concerns over U.S. education. Uh, right around 1958, um, just before I started school, about 10 years later, education started getting pretty serious and a lot focused on math and science. Uh, and we all had lots of homework. That was a given. Not so much anymore. That was probably me, honestly. No, their hair is too long. In 1958, the National Defense and Education Act gave $887 million in loans to needy college students and grants to improve schools. Rigor, rigor, rigor. More, more difficult, strenuous schooling so that we can become... Uh, the most educated people on earth, which we do. We do do that for a little bit. Both the U.S. and USSR sought military uses for space exploration, and in the U.S., the space race had a profound effect on the culture. Everybody was focused on the space race. That also made us be focused on aliens. All of the movies... Beatniks, the Beatniks, the counterculture, the counterculture movie uh, movement of the 50s. The Beats, the Beat movement, the Beatniks. The U.S. economy boomed in the 1950s, just like in the 20s, but it was still run by white men, white men. Um, only 50% of African Americans were still working in good paying jobs and well paying jobs. Uh, many of them were still doing uh, much lower level work, like uh, cleaning or being a driver or mowing lawns or, you know, labor that the white people would not do. Uh, the invention of the transistor allowed the explosion of the electronics field. Transistor radios. We all had transistor radios when I was growing up. Ones you could take with you. They were this big. Uh, international business machines, IBM, prospered building early computers. Big, big, big company, IBM. It still is. Boeing, famous, famous, famous. Uh, my father made tires for Goodrich, but they were for airplanes. Aerospace industries progressed, and Boeing made the first passenger jet airplane in the 707, and it's in the 50s and 60s when we start having commercial flights. Uh, when I was like three or four or something like that, we flew back from California to Ohio, and everybody was dress up, dress up, dress up, dress up, dress up. Everybody dressed up. Now we all wear sweats or jeans or something on a plane. At that time, we were all dressed up. By 1956, white-collar jobs outnumbered blue-collar jobs for the first time. White-collar generally means that you are a professional, that you take a shower in the morning before you go to work, that you probably have a college education, or at least you use only your brain to do your job. Blue-collar means that you t probably take a shower after work and that you do physical labor, uh, maybe mechanics or carpenters or... Uh, anybody that does any kind of laboring with their hands rather than their brains necessarily. They still use their brains, obviously. Women became more common in the workplace despite popular TV shows, Leave it to Beaver, portraying women in stereotypical roles as wives and mothers. My whole childhood I was inundated with 
the idea that I should just be happy and content to be a wife and a mother. Many of my friends, right out of high school, well-defined gender roles, which is why there weren't very many sports when I was growing up for girls. The ideal modern woman married, cooked, and cared for her family and kept herself busy by joining the local PTA and leading a troop of, troop of campfire girls. She entertained guests in her family's suburban house and worked out on the trampoline to keep her size 12 figure. Hey, that's me. Can you see me? The ideal 1950s man was the provider, protector, and the boss of the house. And the organization man, a middle-class white suburban male, is the ideal. It was a male-oriented world, white male-oriented world in the 50s. Such a famous book, Feminine Mystique. It is so good. Um, it is a book that shows that a lot of women are not content to just be wives and mothers and that they don't spend their whole lives growing up to want to do nothing but to be the helpmate to their husbands and to be the, the mother to the children. Um, I think most of you uh, ladies can probably uh, understand that today because now many women focus on going to college and having a career of their own before they're worried about getting married or having kids. Betty Friedan, feminine mystique. The suburb suburban housewife, she was the dream image of the young American woman. She was healthy, beautiful, educated, concerned only about her husband and her children, her home. That's not what she believes. The strong economy encouraged a growth in mass consum consumption like the 20s. Mass advertising now almost entirely on TV. Mass advertising, mass consumption, still credit. Even mass production of houses, suburbia, Levitt towns, cars, TVs, appliances. And then lots and lots and lots of roads, roads, roads. And therefore, we have places that you can go out to eat. You have Hojo's, uh, Howard Johnson's, and Holiday Inn, places to stay if you're traveling. That's all since the 50s. That's the 50s. People didn't do that before. They didn't go anywhere. The first credit cards were used. McDonald's opened, debut of Disneyland, and vast increase in the number of TVs sold. Disneyland. 1946, 7,000 TV sets in the U.S. Right after the war. 7,000. That's probably just this month or this week. 1950, 50 million TV sets in the U.S. What? What? Four years? I don't even want to know what it is now. I have no idea what it could be. Television is a vast wasteland. Mass audience... TV celebrated traditional American values. Women were meant to stay at home. Advertised increasingly used TV to sell products. These are pretty funny. Some of these are pretty funny. This is 1950s advertising. You always have the women being domestic and caring about their man. Can you see it? I think you can see it. They're to take care of their man. Toastmaster, woohoo, we've got toast. And then look, some of the not so appropriate ones. It's a little girl with a gun on her lap. They shoot straight and kill. You may need one only once in your lifetime. Buy now so you'll have it, all, all, have it at that time. What? Accidental discharge impossible. Unless, of course, she pulls the trigger. What? Hey, give me that. Fat, banished. Before you scold me, Mom, maybe you better light up a Marlboro. Here, Mom, have a cigarette. That'll go well for me. How mother and baby picked up a case of Blatt's beer in your home means much to the young mother, and obviously baby participates in its benefits. The malt in the beer supplies nourishing qualities that are essential at this time, and the hops act as an appetizing, stipulating tonic. For breast milk, for the baby, Blatt's beer. Here, Mom, have a drink. Oh, wee, goodness gracious. And then we have famous athletes with their cigarettes. Nice. 
Nice. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Good. Keep smoking, everybody. It's fine. Your doctor's smoking. It's all good. Here's the sexist part. If your husband ever finds out, you're not store testing for fresher coffee. <clears throat> Show her it's a man's world. Oh, my God. Are you serious? Not today, guys. It's not happening anymore. There's a subterranean impetus towards pornography so powerful that half the business world is juiced by the sort of half-sex that one finds in advertisements. Hollywood, Hollywood, Hollywood. Producing films faster than ever before. Sports teams. Lots and lots and lots of sports teams started thriving. Big teams started happening. And then this angst, James Dean, these famous uh, angst-ridden actors, the young actors and actresses. In the 1950s, the word teenager entered the American lexicon. By 1956, 13 million teens with 7 billion to spend a year. So huge teen subculture that didn't exist until the 50s. We talked about it, the counterculture, especially when we get to the beatniks of the 60s and the hippies in the late 60s, early 70s. Music, 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 race music. No, not that. Jungle music, rock and roll, and then Elvis. Rock and roll music was becoming every, uh, very popular. Elvis Presley, Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry. Uh, Buddy Holly is the one that dies in the day the music died. I think Chuck Berry too? No, I don't know. I don't know if he did. If I could find a white man who had the, the Negro sound and the Negro feel, I could make a billion dollars. That's what they believed Elvis was. Hi, me. Elvis and Marilyn Monroe became the sex symbols of the 50s. People were shocked by their overt sexuality. I'm so much more appropriate today. Look at me now. Um... This guy that made these PowerPoints is obsessed with Marilyn Monroe. Many criticize this growing consumer culture, just like in the 20s. Money, money, money. A new generation of writers emerged in the 1950s who wrote novels against the mainstream culture. Anti-mainstream, anti-establishment. Norman Mailer's The Naked and the Dead, James Jones from Here to Eternity, Joseph Heller's Catch-22, and Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five dealt with the suffering of war. Authors explored problems of affluence, wealth, wealth in American life. Oh, that's a good one. 50% of people won't vote and 50% don't read newspapers. I hope it's the same 50%. Tennessee Williams, a streetcar named Desire and a cat on a hot tin roof were plays that explored American values. That's me. Husband number three or something like that. Uh, Arthur Miller's The Crucible used the witch trials as an analogy to the Red Scare McCarthyism. She was married to Arthur Miller. I was married. We were married. Something like that. Catcher in the Rye, the person that killed John Lennon, supposedly had this fixation with the book The Catcher in the Rye and phonyism, things being phony. Happy weekend.